In the 1950s, the aviation industry was moving towards bigger, heavier and more expensive fighter jets. A small British company decided to go against this trend, demonstrating that there was a viable market for affordable, lightweight fighters. They were developing a jet that made other jet fighters look like 747s in comparison. This was the Folland Nat. The Nat was aptly named as it was smaller than almost any jet fighter, even smaller and lighter than the Spitfire, even when fully loaded. Conceived by the ingenious aircraft designer William Petter, Petter's journey through the British aerospace industry was complicated, but his brilliance as a designer was undeniable. Before World War II, he had already crafted the Westland Lysander and Whirlwind, and during the war, he contributed significantly to advancements in the Spitfire. In 1944, he transitioned to English Electric, where he led the team developing the Canberra Bomber and initiated the early work on the Lightning Interceptor. Petter's strong-willed nature and insistence on doing things his way made him a challenging colleague. By 1949, he had moved on once again, this time to Folland Aircraft, where he took on the roles of Managing Director and Chief Engineer. He quickly assessed that the British Ministry of Supply's approach to combat aircraft design was flawed. The new aircraft were becoming progressively heavier and more complex, a trend driven by the demands for improved performance alongside advancing technology. Petter argued that in the event of an actual war, these complex and heavy designs would not be feasible to produce in sufficient quantities for a prolonged conflict. His insights were rooted in his World War II experience, during which his whirlwind design faced cancellation due to its intricate construction and high material demands. Drawing from this background, Petter recognized the likelihood of full-scale war with the communist bloc in the early 1950s. He concluded that a lightweight, simple fighter with low production and operational costs was the most logical and sustainable option for such a scenario. Folland decided to develop such an aircraft at their own expense. Petter preferred the Bristol Orpheus engine for the new aircraft, but it was still under development. To keep the publicity campaign alive and generate interest in both the concept and the new fighter, he first built a proof-of-concept demonstrator. This aircraft made its maiden flight in August 1954. Designated by the company as the FO-139 Midge, the small aircraft was powered by a Viper turbojet producing only 1,640 pounds of thrust. Despite this, it achieved a top speed of 600 miles per hour and could break the sound barrier in a dive. Pilots from various countries who test flew the Midge praised its excellent performance. Though the Midge exceeded all expectations and succeeded as a concept demonstrator, Folland was already advancing, again at their own expense, on a more capable aircraft. The prototype of this new aircraft, named the Nat, first flew in July 1955. Larger than its predecessor, the new aircraft featured a Bristol Siddeley Orpheus jet engine producing 4,700 pounds force of thrust. It was extremely agile, with a top speed of 695 miles per hour, just below Mach 1, and a climb rate of 20,000 feet per minute. The aircraft was remarkably small, with the fighter variant, the F-1, measuring just over 28.5 feet in length and a wingspan slightly over 22 feet. These compact dimensions meant it had limited fuel and ordnance capabilities. Despite these limitations, the new aircraft generated significant international interest. Designed primarily as a dogfighter, the Nat was a pilot's dream to fly. Armed with two 30mm Aden cannons and equipped with four hardpoints for two 500-pound bombs and rockets, the Nat packed a punch. Petter was vocal about his concept for a lightweight fighter, and as a renowned figure in the aerospace community, his ideas gained attention. In 1953, NATO issued a requirement for a new lightweight tactical strike fighter that could carry both conventional and tactical nuclear weapons and be easy to maintain. This came as a valuable opportunity to push the Nat. Of the five entrants, the Nat was consistently placed last by the judges, primarily because it did not have low-pressure tyres for rough airfield operations. Petter refused to compromise by introducing bulges on the fuselage to cater for these larger tyres, and so the Nat lost out. Despite being the only one of the five entrants that actually qualified under the competition's weight rules, the Fiat G91 was eventually selected, but only saw Italian and German service. 
the Royal Air Force showed no interest in the small fighter, having already chosen the larger Hawker Hunter as their new air superiority fighter. However, they saw potential in the Nat as a trainer aircraft. In response, Folland developed a two-seater variant, which would become the most well-known version of the Nat. With a new wing design and a longer fuselage than the fighter variant, the Nat T-1 also featured an improved flight control system and entered service with the RAF in 1962. It became the primary advanced trainer for prospective fighter pilots in the British forces and achieved widespread fame as the first aircraft of the newly formed Red Arrows aerial display team. The Nats T-1 showcased its agility at air shows worldwide, helping the Red Arrows build their legendary reputation. The Nat served as the RAF's advanced trainer until 1978 and with the Red Arrows until 1979, when it was replaced by the Hawk trainer. While the Nat dazzled crowds, it also earned a strong reputation in its intended role as a fighter. Development of the fighter variant proceeded fairly smoothly. Though some problems were found, they were overcome without undue delays or expense. The most serious was longitudinal instability, which meant the joystick could become overly sensitive in certain flight regimes. Much experimentation eventually resulted in a complex gearing between the joystick and tailplane, thus producing in the Nat Trainer a rather unique control system that was to be the bane of many student pilots' life. Petter resisted its introduction on the F-1, preferring to keep the aircraft simpler. Roll rate was found to be remarkably fast regardless of speed, greater than 360 degrees per second, and limiters were introduced to prevent large-scale aileron deflections at higher speeds. Even with the limits introduced, it was clear that the Nat was going to be quite a fighter, and in trials against hunters, it consistently came out on top. The fighter variant garnered significant interest upon its initial demonstration, leading to sales in Yugoslavia, Finland and especially India. India was immediately impressed and ordered the Nat almost as soon as they saw it. By 1958, the first Nats were entering service with the Indian Air Force. Production in India soon followed, starting with parts kits and progressing to full license production, with the first Indian-made Nat flying in 1962. The Nat F-1 became a significant asset for the Indian Air Force and quickly demonstrated its effectiveness as a fighter, just as Petta had envisioned. When the Indo-Pakistani war broke out on September 1, 1965, several IAF squadrons were already equipped with Nats, which played a crucial role in the conflict. The IAF's older vampires and mystères struggled against the Pakistan Air Force's formidable F-86 Sabres, promoting the deployment of Nats to counter the threat. The Nat's small size, speed and agility made it an ideal adversary. On September 3rd, they claimed their first victory by shooting down a Sabre, but over the course of the war, they downed a total of seven Sabres while losing only two Nats to enemy fighters. The Indian military was highly impressed by the Nat's performance. Folland produced 13 F-1s for Finland between 1958 and 1960 and licensed them to produce 20 more. However, after the second Finnish Nat crashed, a campaign arose against the aircraft, deeming it unreliable. Despite this, the Nat represented a significant upgrade over Finland's previous equipment, performing better in many other air forces. Finnish pilots appreciated the Nat, although its longitudinal instability required careful handling. The last two deliveries were the FR Mark I variant, equipped with nose-mounted cameras for reconnaissance. These were successful enough to initiate a 1965 study for an improved FR1 with more fuel and upgraded cameras, but this project was ultimately abandoned. The final foreign order was for two Nats for the Yugoslavian Air Force, delivered in June and July of 1958. After one was lost in a belly landing due to a hydraulic failure, Yugoslavia opted for second-hand F-86 Sabres instead of acquiring more Nats. Meanwhile, the T-1 development continued. The Air Ministry's takeoff and landing distance requirements necessitated a larger wing and the replacement of large flapperons with separate ailerons and flaps. Fuel capacity issues meant conventional drop tanks negatively affected performance and stability leading to the creation of the slipper tank design, attached directly under the wing. Significant changes included the cockpit, which replaced the fighter-style canopy and armoured windscreen with a large, clear canopy and fixed forward portion. The flying control system, improved in the T-1, occasionally posed problems, 
and learning the associated failure drills detracted from general training duties, since students would not encounter such systems in future aircraft. Additionally, the ejector seats in the T-1 were larger and based on the Saab Mark II seat used in the J-29 Tunan, differing from those in the F-1. One innovative feature of this seat was a safety lever instead of safety pins. In the safe position, the lever would dig into the pilot's neck if he tried to sit back, making it always evident whether the seat was safe, without the risk of dropping safety pins into the cockpit. Although a development batch of T-1s was ordered in 1958, the anticipated order for production models was delayed. Many at Folland believed the government intentionally held back the order to force them into a takeover by Hawkers Italy, aligning with the government's strategy to consolidate aviation manufacturers into fewer, larger companies. In August 1959, the first T-1 development aircraft flew. After Folland was acquired by Hawker Siddeley, the production order came through, with 30 units ordered in February 1960. Another order for 20 more followed the next year, and by June 1962, the first production model had flown. The NAT entered service later that year, initially facing some issues. However, as modifications were made to reflect improvements from the F1s produced for India and Finland, reliability improved. Maintenance was challenging due to the confined spaces housing much of its equipment, and its small size caused leg and knee injuries to taller pilots during ejections. Consequently, taller pilots were reassigned to train on other aircraft to prevent further injuries. Despite these issues, most pilots enjoyed flying the NAT due to its excellent performance and maneuverability, offering a much more dynamic experience than the Jet Provosts used for basic training. From an instructor's perspective, it was less favourable due to the restricted view from the rear cockpit and limited shoulder and headroom. In conclusion, the Folland NAT epitomised the innovative spirit of the 1950s aviation industry, showcasing a counter-narrative to the trend of increasingly larger and more complex fighter jets. Despite initial setbacks, the NAT found its place in the Royal Air Force as a trainer and in international markets. The NAT's legacy endures, particularly through its iconic role with the Red Arrows, illustrating the enduring value of Petter's vision for a lightweight, versatile aircraft. If you enjoyed this content, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe for more, and ring that notification bell to stay updated on our latest posts. Thank you for your support.